Thank you, everyone. First service, I was so overwhelmed, I forgot to hook my microphone up, so. Thought I'd correct things, so. You're very, very kind. Second Timothy chapter number one. Um, we are going to stop off at our theme passage of our Holy Calling Conference, our Missions Conference, Acts 1A Conference, one more time. And it'll be referenced here and there, of course. It's a theme that is part of our ministry now for the next year or so, as last year when we looked at Uncommon in Proverbs chapter number 20. And um, so, uh, really, uh, again, another special time together in the Lord. Uh, and we're going to talk about that this morning for a little bit in our introduction, then move beyond the uh, recollection of our time and a reminder of the time we had in the Lord, and then look at this passage as Paul's reminders to Timothy. And uh, you and I know much of what we get together over on Sunday is, is a fresh time. It, it's today's Sunday together will be within itself. Um, my pages stick together from cough drops. Yum, 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 yum. Now you're reconsidering that video now, like, oh, oh, who we got here as a pastor, you can't even. But, uh, no, much of what we teach, much of what we preach through is reminders. And then there's some fresh new layers to it. And depending where we're at in that moment, in that time of life, God's gathered us together in this Sunday, uh, today, October 10th, 2021 is is God's day, snuggling with grand, special Sunday already, my gosh, it's like, can I come down a minute? <laughs> but it's, uh, each time we get together is ordained and put together by God, and as Steve and even mentioned, Steve Kern, and one of his messages, he's reminding us where two or more are gathered, Jesus says, I'll be in the midst, he's talking of the importance of the congregation, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But when we gather together, and I talked to, with Doc 20 years ago about the whole principle, I know that uh, your pastor and the tre teaching and training of how important the gathering of the church is because it's the congregation. And it is, you know, as you look at the Acts 2 project and you think they continued. They were with one accord. They were house to house, but they also gathered in the temple. Why? To have a gathering place together. Well, we're the Holy Spirit's temple individually, but the church body gathering together, Holy Spirit in you, Holy Spirit and believers together, that's a powerful, powerful message to God, to God be the glory. And that's what it's supposed to be, which goes to, of course, Hebrews chapter number 10, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, together is the manner of some is. And David spoke of that, uh, David Guadron on our Tuesday night coffee house gathering, which by the way, those are just tremendous times. So each piece and part of the conference was what it was according to how God put it together. Today is our Sunday, and we're going to look at uh, the conference, the passage. Jose preached out of this passage on, on Sunday evening, and then of course there was many different messages spoken throughout the week. The Fellowship Hall had, of course, David and Nelson both speaking. We recorded both of them. It turned out pretty good there on our YouTube channel at First Bible ADP. Also, too, every single message is up there for you to be able to go through it. Um, if you are here to listen to Steve Kern preach, you must go through each one of his messages at least four and a half more times to digest everything that he covered each night for 60 minutes. And it was just tremendous Bible teaching. And that's what we loved about it because God was leading and directing a man of the word of God, a shepherd for many years, a church planter, a missionary, and God used him in a wonderful, tremendous, just God-honoring way. And, and so we're very, very thankful. I pull all that together to just have you reference a couple of things. And I just want to just portray this for a minute or two with setting up our message. This is a nice card. Now, that was a nice conference. We had a good time, you know. Sometimes, oh, those are nice banners, and that's very nice, and that's nice artwork, and, 
everything turned out nice. Tomorrow we're planning and putting together our, uh, our charity golf tournament, and it's a regional missions outreach, and we're looking forward to a great time. We're praying for rain to start for the football game and pour, and then the skies to exhaust themselves so it'll be dry tomorrow for golf. Is that okay? You can play football in the rain, but you can't play golf in the rain, but the cause and whatever God, but just you know, pray, but say, oh, that's going to be a nice time. We're looking forward to that nice time. Nice brochure. Nice day at Pee Wee football. Nice time in the coffee house. Hey, I had a great time. Did you have a great time? We had a nice time. Sometimes we're so trite. Did you have a nice time? Oh, the praise and worship last week was so good. It was so nice. And sometimes we completely shortchange or just kind of scan over the incredible moments with God. Oh, God, you gave me such a nice time in the Word of God this morning. Thank you. Now I'm off. I forgot everything I had with you. It's a dangerous way to live. We're all drawn into that a little bit, and we need to just say, okay, I need the Word. I need the Spirit of the living God. I need the God of creation, my Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ to become more to me, more meaningful and more serious. And that I don't treat that just like I do a brochure that says, that's nice. Now that was a nice calendar in the back. One of the ushers said, what do we want to do with these, Pastor? Just throw them all away. It's, I said, no, leave them, around. leave them around. Maybe somebody would like to pick one up and, you know, take a look. You ought to, to read all the biographies of this men, these men and pray for them. You know why I put this together like we do? Because if you take this part off, it's designed on purpose, and you get rid of all of that if you didn't want to, here is the note from your pastor on what this conference is about and where we're headed for the year. And on the back is the list of missionaries to pray for every single one of them. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. You know how we go to the trouble to put this card together? Because I want you to get in on board God's incredible blessings of giving to missions. It's a commitment card. Commit. By faith, 2022, commit. I'll give $10 to missions this, every week. I'll give 20, I'll give 50, I'll give 100. I'll give $500 to missions every month. Well, yeah, then we can give more to the missionaries that we already support, which we've committed to do as of Wednesday. By the way, I, see, I think we can sneak that through in the vote. But what a great way for us to say we're more committed to missionaries. We want to get more small groups based on prayer, praying for our missionaries all over the country. We encourage them as they encourage us when we say every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., oh, please, make a commitment to come. Gather in the cafe. As Randy mentioned during the con hey. Get a hold of Randy. There's a hundred ways to get a hold of him and say, I'd like to join the prayer time on Sunday mornings for our missionaries. But you can give. You say, also on the back, there's a place there, First Bible Baptist Church, 25th anniversary project, special offering. Please pick this up. Please pray over it and commit to it so that as God leads you, you're directed to be part of that big project that we would like to get ready for our 25th anniversary. By the way, it's less than eight months away. We really just want to bless the Lord for all the favor he's given us. We want to do a little something in, uh, in this auditorium. And uh, we can, whatever God would have us to do, but be committed to that. What, what am I trying to say? Very simply, that's nice. That's nice. Nice conference, nice message. Again, the next few minutes are our precious time together. Every Sunday I take this very seriously, just as each one of you do. We take it seriously because God, our expectation of God and what he may or may not do, It's variable and it changes depending upon the condition of our hearts and our lives. But through some singing, 
singing holy, holy, holy Jesus you are. The blood, what can wash away my sins? You sing songs like that, you open up to the book of Revelation. As Steve even mentioned during our conference time, every time you see that it's holy, holy, holy. Really complicated praise. So each time that we come together like this, it's okay, God, what are we going to do together? Well, we want to worship you. We want to give you honor and glory. We expect you to teach us and talk to us and show us something. Please feed us from your word. This may be, for some of you, the only time this week, or it may be the first time this week of the whole week of reading, studying, getting closer to God. You were reminded, many of you, and for some of you it was the first time. So again, back to that reminder principle. For some of you, I've heard that before. It takes 72 hours. If I just read the Bible for 12 to 15 minutes a day, you will read through your Bible in one year. It's a beautiful thing. You can do that. Chapter. Another chapter. Another, you, we can do this together. And what does it do? That puts us in a place where we're expecting something. It's not just, oh, that was nice, and that was a good thing, and that was okay, and I heard that was this. And th-. It's more than that because there's a depth in relationship that God says, I'm predestined to become formed to the image of Christ. I want you to become more like Jesus. And I have more for you than you realize, all of us. No matter where you are, there's more for you. There's another step to take to get closer to God. There's more for you to be sanctified. Fit for the masters. You want to be, listen, I want to be used by God. And I look in all the texts and all the, all the messages and I think of what Steve brought and what David brought and what Nelson brought. And I think of all that Jose taught and each one of them and then in the coffee house and sharing their heart and we spent hours together. That was not for naught. That was not void. That was not vanity. That, there was something here that happened. Just like right here, right now. Just like your quiet time in the morning, the afternoon, or the evening. Just like in your prayer time. It's also very, very meaningful. And going back to this passage of scripture one more time. I pray that God continues to just open it up to you. And the depth of this holy calling principle becomes stronger and stronger in your life. Because God's word tells us that an invitation from him, the holy calling, it's an invitation, a divine invitation to embrace salvation is something that you and I know about. And sometimes we miss that God's constantly inviting us. He wants us to join him we need to look and say okay god what would you have next well i'd like you to come and sup with me i made a meal for you i've i've prepared a beautiful table for you i've set the table where i I just want you to come and bring your heart bring your mind your soul your everything and love me and i will give you something special and that's kind of what happened with the Acts 1A conference. Many of you were able to be here. Some of you could not. But we put all those messages up on the YouTube part. But also we have them on the Facebook part. And you grab the, the music and the time. Justin Gambino and all the different singers and the musicians. It was just wonderful. And God put something beautiful together for us. And he says, I invite you to more of that. We have these big conferences and these big times and then we have the Sunday morning gathering so that it's just a continual sanctification from God in our holy calling, in our salvation and for some of us even more than that. You heard lots of stuff this past week. So in regards to the many sermons that were preached and the praises that were sung, what are your thoughts? I mean, I just gave you a few of my thoughts. And if I was to give you the floor, many of you would share some things. I've already talked back and forth with many of you. It was really just a sweet, godly, edifying, exhorting, encouraging time. Message titles, scriptures, notes and quotes and points and lessons that we heard. We learned. We learned so much. I loved it. What made a difference with you for God. The question was worded strategically. What made a difference with you for God instead of for you? Mm. Our coffee house time. 
each evening, those gatherings, people came in, and there was three people, and then there was 30, and then there was more, and there was some coffee and some desserts. It brought us a deep insight into some of the, each one of the missionaries' hearts, each one of them. Which missionary did God use to, to move on your heart? Again, some of you were not able to make those. That's good. God put together a neat crowd and a group. We kept the doors closed. The people in here were working in their music and their singing and praising, getting ready for 7 o'clock. And we could have gone on and on. That's how good it was in the Lord. So if you looked at my note that I wrote in that Bible, excuse me, missions conference brochure, it had something in there. It has something in there about the body of Christ crying out for those that are called with a holy calling to pursue God as he has pursued each one of us. I put in there, you know what, believers? Today we must be reminded of the same holy calling if you read it. Our calling moves beyond our salvation just as Paul's did. It involves the sanctification of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. We keep on reminding each other that's what we need to be reminded of. Why is there such a resistance to the holy calling of God in a believer's life? What did God appoint you to over the last few years through your sanctification? Who has been instrumental in your growth through discipleship? What ongoing mentorship, training, teaching do you submit yourself to for enhancement of your calling? Is it time for you to move a little bit forward and a little bit further? Because God's saying you need to move. You need to go and there's no longer... There's no longer the idea that it can wait till later. You see, Paul in this text with Timothy is really reminding him, yes, challenging him, yes, getting him ready for the next layer of battleground as a pastor of the church at Ephesus that Paul started. He is again saying, Timothy, I don't have much time. In my last part, I'm going to kind of put together a, a battlefield manual. And I want you to know that there's something about you and about each of us that we need to be confronted with. You say, what is that? Why ashamed? Why ashamed? Look in your Bible. Verse number 8. We're going to read the whole thing in a moment. Verse number eight says, Be not thou now, excuse me, be not thou therefore ashamed. Verse number twelve. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Verse number sixteen. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus, for he hath refreshed me and was not ashamed. Why ashamed? Why? Why ashamed? It kind of bugs me. Like Steve's talking about all these quirky passages he preaches. Oh my God. We're, we're. I can barely get to the simple passages. Why a shame? Why? Because maybe it's pretty simple and straightforward to each one of us that we've all been in a place at one time or another, maybe currently, looking to the future, wondering when will I be ashamed again? You say, well, the Bible says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. That's a good one. I got that one. That's a good verse, good, good passage. Memorize it, yes. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I believe that most believers are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But I wonder if we're ashamed of delivering the gospel. Why ashamed? See, Paul's ignore, exhorting and challenging Timothy. This is the manual for combat. He overcame these, he wants him to overcome these growing obstacles because he's pastoring an incredibly cool church that then later on we find in the book of Revelation lost its first love. He's saying, use your spiritual equipment, the word of God for battle. He's saying, would you put on the whole armor of God, you knucklehead? And if you don't do that, you're going to be a mess. You are a little bit timid. You are a little bit of an acquiescer. You are a backpedal a little bit. But even as Jose said, there's no clear-cut reason. All we know is the character of Timothy. All we know is that he's working through things. He is a good pastoral leader here. He has overseen an incredible church. But you've got to think, Paul knew Timothy. And he needed to push him. And he needed to encourage him. Because hardships are going to come. 
Hardships are going to be there. Absolutely, they're coming. And Timothy, you better be reminded of all that persecution from the outside world when you tell them about Jesus Christ. They're going to persecute you, and they're going to stink and run you down, and they're going to tell you, I don't need that Jesus. Stop preaching it. And then you're going to have in your church, in your family, you're going to have dissension. You're going to have divisiveness, and you're going to have difficulties. Timothy, you better be ready because you cannot be ashamed. You cannot be in a place where you're ashamed. Timothy had a tendency to drop back, not handle conflict. You can see he had to be taught again and again and be reminded of the persecution from the lost again and what deception can come in the body. Okay, now, holy calling. Holy calling. Transfer that thought to your family, to your home and your house. And in your community, you stand up for Jesus Christ, you're going to get the persecution from without. If you have a couple children, one or two here and there, or some of you wives that are married to a child, you know what I'm talking about? Then you think, wow, this is not so easy as the way I thought it was going to be. In fact, it's more difficult. There is division and deceptiveness and things that go on. And you think, okay, in this text of 2 Timothy chapter number 1, in this this laying out of things, you're going, okay, okay. We've already covered this passage. We already got this. Well, sometimes, for me, it's not just, oh, that was a good message. Or, thanks a lot, I appreciate that. Or, that was really good. Or, it's, I got to go back there and look again, and I need to look again. I've already read, reread through my notes and all those different things that God did, and sometimes I do a, a, a review, but God showed some things to me in my own personal way. This is just God led me to say, okay, preach through this thing for a few minutes, and we'll put it down for a little while, but we will reference the holy calling, a holy calling throughout this coming year, because God has given us as a church a holy calling. God has given us a calling individually, many of us. God has given a calling to many that I believe are ashamed of their calling of God. How is it that God stopped calling people to the mission field? He didn't stop. How is it that men are calling themselves but they will not get the confirmation from the word of God and from the shepherd of the church? How is it That we get things so out of order and we think that God's going to work through that. And Paul lays it down for Timothy and says that this is the way it has to be. Watch out of how much you acquiesce and backpedal. How much you give in and how much your timidity gets in the way. Because you will become a place and a man and a ministry of shamedness. To be ashamed. Let's read the text here. Let's read the text. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, verse number 8. Be now thou, excuse me, be not thou, therefore, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Two different things. Don't be ashamed of me and my testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of that, brother. Don't be ashamed of your testimony, Lord, and do not be ashamed of me as a prisoner, But be thou partaker of the afflictions, the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9, our theme verse for the conference. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel Woo, hallelujah. Verse 11, he then speaks of his own personal calling, whereunto I am appointed, a preacher, apostle, and teacher of the Gentiles. Verse 12, as he references what he just said about his calling. For the which cause I also suffer these things. The which cause is what I've been called to and appointed to. I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Why ashamed? Well, the meaning of ashamed is generally used as an adjective. The word shame is the noun. 
Ashamed is the adjective to describe someone in a place. You acting like your behavior is filled with shame or you are ashamed. It is when one is feeling the guilt or shame. Shame is generally used as a noun, whereas ashamed is typically used as an adjective. What does feeling ashamed mean? I feel guilty. I feel at a place where I'm disgraced. I'm kept from doing something by fear of shame or embarrassment. I'm ashamed. It says in the 1828 dictionary, affected by shame is the word ashamed. Abashed or confused by guilt or a conviction of some criminal action or indecorous conduct or by the exposure of some gross errors or misconduct which the person is conscious must be wrong and which tends to impair his honor or reputation. It just really comes down to when we feel ashamed, we have a sense of guilt. We have a sense of disgrace. And usually it's because of our behavior. Yes, here. But mostly here. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but I am ashamed of my testimony of you, Lord. Sometimes I wonder, a lot of things I wonder, but I put this little quote in our brochure as another push for all of us to be reminded, I wonder what it would be like. Because the world to me is what Dwight L. Moody says, has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. To declare sacred is what consecrated means. To set apart or dedicated to the service of God, make something an object of honor. When you look at that a holy calling statement. The divine invitation to embrace salvation in the kingdom of God. If you and I really embrace our salvation, we then say, I want more Jesus. I want more to be more like you. I want to live to be and do and accomplish more. I want to see myself be predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ by you doing the work. I want you to work in my heart and my soul by your word. I want to see your word just, 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 just come into me in such a way. And that's what we need. And it still ought to be a yearning. If you've been saved 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 5 years or 5 minutes, it should be a yearning for us not to be in a place where we're ashamed, but rather saying, yes, God, you called me with a holy calling when you saved my soul. And now, I want more. I just got to have more. I can't continue to go this way. The body of Christ cries out, yes, for those that are called with a holy calling. But the body of Christ also cries out with praises unto God for the provision of those who have gone before us and answered the holy calling. And I thank all of you who have fulfilled your holy calling and continue to do so. You're an example to me. You're a model of Jesus Christ. You're a model of not being ashamed. But here's Timothy, one of the real stalwart believers and followers and leaders in your New Testament who's having to be reminded don't be ashamed. Watch out how you can get to a point where you're ashamed. Well, to me, in this text, there's some, again, simple things in our, our lesson today. Simple things that reinforce the fact that we don't need to be ashamed. We, we, we need not to be. We don't have to be. We don't have to be stuck there. Why ashamed? Well, I see that we are answered in this text and with supportive Bible that is addressing the same topic, same truth about sanctification and the holy calling and what we ought to be, is, hey, we do not need to be settling for being ashamed. I'm ashamed that I don't know this. I'm ashamed that I don't know that. 
Well, good. Then let's do something about it together. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to go here. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. There was a guy named Solomon like that who wrote an incredible bunch of books in the Old Testament that really are insightful to the malady of man when they're ashamed. That man, when you read what he wrote, was ashamed. He was ashamed of his life before God when God gave him so much. David was ashamed. He was called out in 2 Samuel 7 in a covenant with God to build his housing place. And at the end of his life, God says, you will not be allowed to build it. I hate to have that happen. You're a man of murder and you have blood on your hands. You see, we all could be at a place where shame, being ashamed, just like Timothy. And I, I just see where this text, and you can imagine what God's been doing in my life the last couple months, studying through, reading it through, presenting something to these preachers and pastors, and they, and they accomplish far beyond anything I could have ever hoped for in the vision of our conference. And now, we've got to do something with this. So the first thing, and a supplemental point of our lesson today, we need not be ashamed. This is how this goes. We need to be reminded of his amazing grace that generated the holy calling of God. Somehow we get down the road, just like David did, nothing beyond his grace. We preached through that a couple years ago in 2 Samuel and his kingship in his leadership of Israel. He needed to be reminded of God's grace in his life, God's mercy in his life. Timothy needed to be reminded of the amazing grace that generated his holy calling. God's called us by grace. We are part of everything that he's put us in because of his grace. There's nothing that you have ever earned before God when it comes to your eternal life, when it comes to your holy calling, when it comes to him setting you apart to be like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you have done, no righteousnesses that you could ever do. You're not to be in a place of shame. We're not to be ashamed of that, but assured. We need to be reminded of his amazing grace. We need not be that way. Amazing grace, this amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace gives us, just as his children, his believers, the clarity that he has set us apart in a holy calling to get after it, to accomplish what he wants us to do. You need to be reminded constantly. We talk about it a lot around here. And I won't stop until I take my last breath. You need to be reminded of you getting saved by grace. For by grace are you saved. You ought to be fired up and going, yeah! Because that's incredible to be reminded that you are saved and you're going to glory. For by grace. The holy calling is by grace. If you think that you could do anything to earn a spot in his glorious way without his grace, you're foolish. If people think that they can pastor a church or go to the mission field without his grace, they're a fool. And you'll go and you'll go on your own merit and you will fall on your face. And I've seen it in my short years so many times. And I want to be in that place of grace because I don't want to be ashamed of failing my great and glorious God who sent his son to die for me. We need not be ashamed. We need, not, we need to be reminded of his amazing grace. It's incredible what he's done for me, what he's done for you. You need to be assured that in his grace, he's got you taken care of. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, yes, but am I ashamed of the testimony of the Lord because my testimony stinks? That's what's heartbreaking. So I need to do something about it. I need to fall on my face before a holy God and say, God, I give you permission to tear me up. 
do what you've got to do because I want to be more like Jesus by your grace, through your mercy, because I cannot earn what you will give me in your holy calling. Paul reminds us in Galatians, of course we studied through that this year, it says in Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb it called me by his grace. And he continued, he says, to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred, not with the flesh and the blood. You don't confer with the flesh and the blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them with apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, returned again unto Damascus, I got away with God. And I found out who this one is that saved me. You see, Paul got it, and Paul passed it along. He was reminding Timothy, you don't need to be ashamed. According to God's incredible grace, he saved wicked Saul. Saul was wicked. He was rotten. He consented to murder Christians. And according to God's plan, in verse number 16, he saved him. And he went to preach to the heathen. And you and I forget these things. You need to be reminded that God has got a holy calling for you. God had a specific person, purpose for Paul. And he's the only one in the Bible. Eh, you're wrong. He has something for Timothy. He has something for you. He has something for Nisiphorus. We'll look at him in a minute. You see, God's got something for you. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I'm wondering. You're ashamed. It's okay. Admit it and take it to the Lord and say, God, in my shame, I'm acting like I am ashamed. I'm disgraced by myself. It's just you and God. Just you and God, believers. If you're lost and you're not born again and you know that you're not saved and you're going to go to hell when you die because you know you've never asked God, you never called on the name of the Lord to save you as the Bible says. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, and to get to God, not of work, lest any man should boast. It's not about how you can earn your way. It is you and I realizing, as I did back in 1983, I couldn't save myself. It was the Savior that came from glory who died for me and died for you. So, if you need to be born again, this ought to be a good day to do so. And if you are born again, then it is time for you and I to say, hey, just like Timothy, you're in good company. Hey, I'm ashamed of the way I've been. So what? Don't look around the room. Just look to him. Because he's the one that knows my shamedness. He knows my places. He knows me. The second little piece that I have for you in our lesson today is we need not be ashamed because this. We need to be reminded that Jesus Christ keeps us against that day in the holy calling. As we covered verse number 8, look at verse number 12. Again, let me reiterate for you. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For this cause, the cause which I suffer them is the things that I've been called to. Go back to verse number 10. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, had brought life, immortality to light through the gospel. In light of that, I have now been called, I've been appointed, God has given me an assignment, a holy calling, and I am to preach. So I'm a preacher. I am an apostle. I'm a sent one. I am a teacher of the Gentiles, and that's what God assigned me to do. Hallelujah, do it. He... God continues to do this because he says, through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I keep things. Verse number 12, the second half says, for I know whom I have believed and have persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed. You've committed to him. He says, I've committed to you. When you make a commitment to God and God says, this is my commitment, this is what I'm doing, I'm doing it in my word, I'm doing it according to my word, then he will keep it unto him against that day. Paul was totally and completely confident in Christ. You know Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. These are verses you need to be reminded of. You need to memorize them. You need to have them on the tip of your brain. So you go, I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at... That day, the day of Jesus, the day of his coming, that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Pretty fired up right there. You say, oh, it's going to be a tough time in the judgment seat. Yeah, but after that, it's glory. Woohoo! 
Aren't you looking forward to that? It's like, you don't have to get old to think about that. If it's done tonight, hallelujah. Well, we're going to miss out on golf tomorrow. Seriously? There's a lot of things that cause us to be ashamed. Sometimes it's where our mind and our hearts are. It says in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? Verse number 12 and 13. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate, witness a good confession. Keep this commandment without spot. Woo! Unbebukable. It's your salvation. It's giving that testimony, that confession of Jesus saving your soul. Paul's saying it. Hey, keep this commandment without spot. Make your testimony right, Brown. Get your act together, Brown. Because it says in verse number 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the right, which no man can approach unto, whom not, no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That's First Timothy 6. Highlighted verse number 14, but that's 12 through 16. Wow, what an incredible exhortation from Paul to Timothy. Throughout both of these letters, 10 chapters between the two letters of exhortation. Don't backpedal, don't be timid, don't be ashamed, don't fall into the trap, don't become to a point where you're just passing everything down the road, kicking everything down the road, kicking the can down, make it right. Make us, we need to make, all make things at a place where you go, okay, God, I've been ashamed of a few things. But you don't need to. Last one. We need not be ashamed. Jesus keeps things. Everything is founded in his holy calling by his grace. And lastly, very simply, verse number 16, we need to be reminded of the opportunity to refresh those who suffer in the holy calling of God. What Steve Kern, David Guadron, Nelson Rivas, and Jose Valter did for this church is refreshed us all by being in their presence. Incredible refreshment. Every one of them was an Isiphorus. When Jose gave testimony of being at Randy and Linda's house and how, they were re how he was refreshed by them, that was Mr. and Mrs. Anisiphorus. Handing them refreshment after refreshment after refreshment, which is in the body of Christ by the word of God. With hospitality and kindness and love in sound words, sound mind. You see in verse number 13 in your text, 2 Timothy chapter number, thir uh, chapter number 1, look at verse number 13. See, you're all stuck on verse number 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. What does he say in verse number 13? Sound words. Do you know what you can do with some sound words? Words filled with love and truth, grace, mercy. Ooh, wow. Really? Did he put that in there? Sound words? Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love. That's a refreshing drink of water. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us, this thou knowest that thou, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phalgeus and Hermogenius. Verse, so those guys, mm, verse 16. I love this Anisiphorus guy. <laughs> the Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus. Why? Because he oft refreshed me. What a great blessing upon your life. And was not ashamed of my chain. Verse number 17. But when he was in Rome, he, Rome, he sought me out very diligently. Okay, now follow this. Follow this now. And found me. 
Verse 18, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. That means when Paul started the church, he met him. But then he's gone back to Rome in prison. And Anisiphorus, businessman, something, I don't know. A blessed man in the kingdom. A saint of God. Yeah, I'm going to Rome today. I'm going to go see how Paul's doing. Think of the story. He went out of his way to care for someone. And it's written in God's word for all of eternity. It's just like the memorial that said of her who anointed Jesus. It also says in one other stop, spot about Anisiphorus up on the screen in verse number 19 of 2 Timothy. Salute Prisca and Aquila, which is Priscilla, and the household of Anisiphorus, Esterus, excuse me, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Militum sick. Do thy diligence to come before the winter. The meaning of Onesiphorus' name, bringing profit. Names mean something, don't they? This man's name means bringing profit. Profit to others. He cared for other people. And he oft refreshed the man who had a holy calling upon his life. You may not understand the depth of what all of you did at First Bible Baptist Church for Nelson, Steve, David, and Jose. I mentioned how they refreshed us. But what you did for those men, I heard from their own mouth. It means so much to them that in God's incredible body, the body of Christ, in God's kingdom work, that God's people would refresh someone like you refresh those four men. They were blessed, yes. They were strengthened, yes. Encouraged and thankful, yes. They were oft refreshed. Please know that what Paul is saying here is mighty and powerful, and he's communicating it to Timothy to not be ashamed of people like Anisiphorus in your life. Let them do that for you. That's a hard lesson to learn. But it's something very, very important. You see, God's faithful refresh. They're not ashamed. They're, 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 they're not in a position where if they, oh, I, I'm ashamed of the bondage and suffering I'm going through. I have a rough life. They don't talk that way. They seek brotherhood diligently. I've heard that from other people. I wrote notes down in my Bible over that. It's powerful what you can do to oft refresh someone in the holy calling. And maybe that's your holy calling. You're not to be ashamed of this holy calling. You're not to be ashamed of the calling in your salvation. I finish with these three verses up on the screen. Very simple. I love this principle. When you study and read your Bible, you have a lot of years things come to you. And all of you have read your Bible for a long time. You go... Wow, this is so good. There's such a harmony. and such a beautiful, beautiful. of course, in the Gospels and, and all that, and the church letters and what Paul wrote. And, but Peter wrote some stuff, too. And John wrote some stuff, too. Now watch this as we finish. Paul said to the Philippians 1.20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Nothing. No matter how far I get out over my skis, no matter how high the diving board I got to jump, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be my life or my death. That's not surprising that Paul wrote that, right? So Peter wrote some stuff too. You know You've heard this. Let's put it together a little bit now. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him, he doesn't just blow off of it, 
all those in Christ Jesus have suffered persecution. We know that, but this verse says, let him not be ashamed if you suffer. But let him glorify God on this behalf. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. And here's old John. John's pretty good. He's written a little bit. He says in 1 John 2, And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed and try and hide before him at his coming. Wow. I don't think you can get too much better than that. Paul, Peter, John, all three said, I will not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. I will not be ashamed. And Timothy, he's like, the same thing I'm doing. Thank you, God, for your grace that you would take the time to whack a knucklehead upside the head and say, get a handle on this, Mark. Get a handle on the holy calling. Get a handle on what I'm here for. I will keep that which you've committed because my Jesus, my son, God the Father sent, my, sent his son, and he says, hey, he'll keep it until the day that everything that you have in the calling through your salvation to this point is all by my grace. And when you're off refreshed by others, just absorb it and don't be ashamed that they want to refresh you. That goes to every one of you. Why? Why ashamed? Here's your question for invitation. We need not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or the holy calling from the Lord. Don't be ashamed of that. Today, would you just put it away, that ashamedness, put away your shame of Jesus Christ. Join me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you because of and in the name of Jesus Christ. We preach and teach your word and sing songs because he is worthy. He is the Lord of lords, the potentate, the mighty, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Thank you, God, our Father, through Jesus Christ that we have access into the most holy place. I'm ashamed that I do not take more advantage of that. I pray this morning in this time in your word, the last few minutes, that you've been honored and glorified. That's all my desire has been. That's all my prayer has been. And I pray that your audience, your people, the saints, the believers, have heard what you want them to hear and that their response will be according to your invitation. I pray for anyone that's lost today, if they're not born again, that you'll tug on their hearts, put them in a place of conviction, and that they will come to a place of brokenness, and they will be drawn forward to be able to come and receive Christ. I pray that you'll have your way in this invitation time in Jesus' name. Please stand, if you would, as the music plays.